Good morning to you all and welcome to the Getting to the Point with Larry Ty. I'm Caroline Angel Burke, the Vice President of Education, Visitor Experience and Collections at the Kennedy Institute. The Institute is delighted to host Larry Ty and Lisa Mullins for this virtual Getting to the Point conversation on Larry's latest book, Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator McCarthy. Released last month, Demagogue draws upon new archival findings to tell the complex, compelling, and shocking story of Senator Joseph McCarthy. His agenda to uncover supposed communists who had infiltrated the United States government played off Americans' Cold War fears, as well as to the TV cameras. The Senator's unfounded accusations would eventually ring hollow, but not before he smeared the names of dozens of individuals and undermined confidence in governmental institutions. And as I'm sure we'll see, the echoes of this demagogue's behavior ring loudly today. First, I'm happy to share a bit about our speakers. Larry Tai is a New York Times bestselling author and is known for many books, including his biography on Robert F. Kennedy entitled Bobby Kennedy, The Making of a Liberal Icon. From 1986 to 2001, Larry was an award-winning winning reporter at the Boston Globe, where his primary beat was medicine. He certainly wasn't limited to that topic, however, as he served as the Globe's environmental reporter, a roving national writer, an investigative reporter, and a sports writer. In addition to writing, Larry runs the Health Coverage Fellowship, which trains journalists to report on critical issues like public health, mental health and high-tech medicine. Our moderator today is Lisa Mullins, who many of you will certainly know as the host of WBUR's All Things Considered. So whether she realizes it or not, Lisa is one of my favorite driving companions. Lisa is program anchor as well as conducts interviews and reports from the field. Lisa is also a guest anchor for WBUR and NPR Midday Show here and now. Before hosting All Things Considered, Lisa spent 14 years as the chief anchor of the daily international news program, The World, co-produced by the BBC, WGBH, and PRI. Just a quick reminder to all of you that if you do have a question that you'd like to submit for our speakers for consideration during the program, there, um, please email programs at emkinstitute.org. That should pop up in your chat box. Um, during the program. And with that, I'll hand the conversation over to Lisa. Lisa? Thank you, Caroline. It is a true pleasure to be here. There's a special place in my heart for the Institute and, uh, and certainly for Larry Tai, not so much for Joe McCarthy, but definitely for Larry Tai, who I'm happy to say I was part of the, um, the healthcare um, uh, fellowship uh, that Larry sponsors uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and it was a fantastic experience. Um, the book is uh, fascinating for many reasons, and, and we want you to, uh, there are a couple hundred of you out there, when you have questions, feel free to submit them. I will ask them as many as I can to Larry. One of the reasons though I, I wanna start off with this, Larry, is that when, when you first started talking about the book, you, um, I mean, it seemed like Joe McCarthy was a good person to write about, of course he is, but, I wonder how you could have known just how relevant his story would be now and, and why you decided to write the book when you wrote it. So I wish I could say I was prescient in understanding just how relevant it was gonna be. The truth is that a couple days before the 2016 election, I had signed up to write a very different book, a biography of Barack Obama and it became clear the day after the election that we wouldn't know Barack Obama's legacy until the end of the era of Trump and that suddenly the Joe McCarthy story went from looking like a story of ancient history to a story of today. But I also wanna say one of the things that first inspired me to think about writing about Joe McCarthy uh, was a Kennedy connection. And the connection was that when I was writing a biography of Bobby Kennedy, I interviewed 450 people. And among that group, there was only one who was truly essential. And that was a woman named Ethel Kennedy. And one of the things that Ethel Kennedy said to me that I could never get out of my head was that Joe McCarthy might be a monster to much of the world, 
but to Bobby and Ethel Kennedy, he was just plain good fun. And the notion of Joe McCarthy as good fun was so counterintuitive that I thought there's got to be another thread to this story that I don't know and that the history books have lost. And I think that's the reason that you start off uh, the book with the story of Tail Gunner Joe, because Joe McCarthy had a background in the military, and it's very interesting because he then targeted the military later on. But, but this, one of the things I think you did in the book is to really turn on its head, just like what you said uh, Ethel Kennedy did, and that is present a different view of McCarthy, not a prescribed view that we know that many other um, uh, biographers have done. And this tail gunner Joe, it actually, I mean, there's a certain certain aspect of the story that makes you really feel bad for the guy. And that happens a lot throughout the book. Could you tell us that story? Um, so I will. So I want to start out by saying that for every author who ever starts out to write a book, there is somewhere a holy grail of materials that you wish you could get a hold of and you generally don't. And for me, the holy grail was all the papers, his personal and professional papers that his widow left 60 years ago to his alma mater Marquette University. They had been under lock and key for 60 years. The family had either said no to everybody who had asked to see them or just said nothing. And they said a whole lot of no and nothing to me. And exactly one week after I told my publisher and my wife that we were not going to get access to those papers, I got an email from the chief archivist at Marquette saying, you're shocked and I'm shocked, but they've said yes. And they've said a special kind of yes, which is you can have a look at them and the day you start looking at them, they're going to go back under lock and key. And those files included, among other things, McCarthy's first person writings in real time when he was serving in the South Pacific during World War II. And those diaries showed things about his service there that we didn't know and that punctured a lot of myths. And the great story about McCarthy's time in the South Pacific was that he used it mainly to plot a campaign for the US Senate when he got back. And he came back with the moniker Tail Gunner Joe, saying to Wisconsin voters, I was a hero in World War II, and I'm now going to bring back the same heroism to represent you in the US Senate. Well, all the reporters in Wisconsin and all of his critics looked at that and said, Joe, you're doing it again. You're embellishing to the point of lying. You weren't a tail gunner. And tail gunner Joe went from being his moniker to his caricature. NBC did an hour long documentary, mockingly calling it tail gunner Joe. Well, now 70 years after the fact, we know that he was telling the truth. We know that he was, in fact, a land-based intelligence officer as his official assignment, but that any time he could, he volunteered to go up in a plane, that he came under enemy fire, that he often was back there as the tail gunner, and that he didn't have to do this. We know that partly from the diaries I was just talking about. Even more compellingly, we know it from written testimony that was in those files from all of his squad mates, the people who took him up in those planes. And one of the things that this says to me is, um, it's partly sad that the guy was never believed about something like his World War II heroism, but it also says, if you lie often enough, on the rare occasion when you're telling the truth, we're not gonna buy it. Can I ask you, Larry, why uh, was Marquette planning on number one, showing you that archival material, uh, and number two, locking it up after you saw it? Because that was what the only person who mattered to them, the one who had been given the lock and key, McCarthy's daughter, his infant daughter at the time he died, um, she said, let this guy see it. And because she didn't say anybody else could see it, they interpreted it literally the way they had to, which was only I could see it. At the beginning, because she hadn't given me explicit permission to copy the papers, I had to get an army of interns into the archives with me and we couldn't Xerox anything. So they had to take verbatim 
notes of the material that I was looking at. She ended up giving permission saying, you can copy it, you can use the pictures, you can use whatever, but because it was only said for me, um, that was the only one who could do it. And Lisa, you know me well enough to know that if I were to tell our listeners today that she gave me the permission because I was charming, that that is simply not true. <laughs> I think she gave it for one of two reasons, either because my collaborator in asking her, who happened to be the daughter of Joe McCarthy's best friend, a broadcast journalist named uh, Greta Van Susteren, was asking on my behalf, and because I was such a pain in the neck that the easiest way to get me to go away was to say, yes, go away, stop asking me. You're a charming pain in the neck. Um, <laughs> And Greta Van, Van Susteren, um, her father uh, was involved with Joe McCarthy. Can you just give us the brief background on that? Sure. So her father was an attorney. He was Joe McCarthy's best man at the wedding. From the time they were both young people in Appleton, Wisconsin, growing up together, to the time Joe McCarthy died, Van Susteren was the closest thing McCarthy had to a loyal best friend. He was a huge character. He, on the one hand, um, went along with a lot of the crazy things McCarthy did and acted as his campaign manager. On the other hand, he was more responsible than Joe McCarthy and got him to try to stop drinking. Um, he railed at McCarthy's, many of McCarthy's excesses. And other than Joe McCarthy, the single person in this, proce uh, this whole process that I would most like to have been able to go out for a beer with and have a long conversation was Urban Van Susteren. Joe McCarthy, I would also have liked to, in the way that Ethel Kennedy suggested, gotten to see that other side of him by seeing him not during the day when he was destroying people's lives, but at night when he was inviting those same people who had been the witnesses testifying beforehand to go out for a beer with him, because to Joe McCarthy it was all a game, and he thought everybody understood those rules. So he thought it was a game, but, but people's lives were ruined, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But first, I wonder if you can draw the line, and, and I hate the fact that we have to fast forward here uh, in the McCarthy story, but draw the line from um, tail gunner Joe, the guy who was actually a tail gunner, to um, how he ended up investigating um, uh, those who he assumed to be communist, and tell us what was happening um, in the background in the United States that led to the acceptance of this kind of uh, question as to communist infiltration. Sure. So the line is a very simple one. It's a line of Joe McCarthy being a backbench, do-nothing senator who in 1950 looked like he was destined to become a one-term senator. And he was desperate for an issue to put him in the limelight. He goes, I want to take our listeners back to one night that gives a sense of who Joe McCarthy was. And that night was February 9th, 1950. Joe McCarthy, given how unexceptional a senator he was, was invited on a famous night for Republicans all across America, the night of Abe Lincoln's birthday. Um, if you're a prominent Republican, you get invited that night to deliver the Lincoln Day dinner in a place like Boston or New York, Chicago or Washington. If you're Joe McCarthy, you get invited to what his staff called Wheeling, West by God, Virginia. <laughs> he shows up there that night with a briefcase containing two speeches. One is a snoozer of a speech on national housing policy, which is something he actually knew a bit about. Had he delivered that speech that night, Lisa, you and I wouldn't be here 70 years talking about Joe McCarthy. Instead, he reaches deep into the briefcase for the second speech, and that is a barn burner of a speech. It's a speech that he pulls out and holds up in his hand. It is a speech that he's probably never seen before he pulls it out that night from his briefcase. It is a speech where he says, I have in my hand a list of 205 spies at the US State Department. These are people that President Truman should have known about. If he did, he should have rooted them out. And he said, this is the issue of our day. Now, our day was a day when red China had recently gone from being nationalist China to red China. 
when the Rosenberg atomic spies had been recently arrested, tried, and we were worried that now our arch enemy, the evil Soviet Union, now had our atomic secrets. It is a time when, Lisa, you are too young to remember, and I can barely remember that we were about to teach our kids that they ought to do something called duck and cover. And what that meant was, if there was an atomic explosion, which looked like a realistic risk, they ought to put their hands over their head and duck under their desks in school, and they'd be safe that way from any atomic fallout. That is how scared we were. Joe McCarthy, like all brilliant demagogues, understood that fear, he played to that fear, and his speech that night put him just where he wanted to be, which was on the front page of every newspaper in America, and he never looked back. So he rolled the dice and read the American public well at that point. But, but uh, to what extent, uh, I mean, there, there were people who were adherents to communism on, in one level or another. How, how much of a hold did communism have on, um, from the everyday Americans to Hollywood, a uh, big target of Joe McCarthy, to musicians, to politicians? It had a hold on everybody. It was the defining fear of the era. That's why we call it the era of the Red Scare. Joe McCarthy was not the first to raise the specter of communists and even traitors within our own government. He was the first to do it with enough the opportunism and enough of a cowboy sense that you don't just name, you don't just accuse the State Department of harboring traitors, that if you name the traitors and count them, people will truly pay attention. So instead of this movement that he helped light a fire under being called Dyism, after, after Martin Dyes, the famous head of the House on american Activities Committee, who was out there a dozen years before McCarthy trying to capture the same imagination of America, and instead of it being called Trumanism, because President Harry Truman had what I think was a highly irresponsible loyalty test that he put every government employee before. It was called McCarthyism. He wasn't the first, he certainly wasn't the most sincere, but he was the one who did it with enough aplomb that now, 70 years later, McCarthyism is alive and well, even if Joe McCarthy wasn't. And can you give us a reality check, though? How much of a threat was communism to the U.S. at the time? So communism, if we're talking about the Soviet threat, was very real. Communism, if we're talking about spies at the State Department or elsewhere in the government, all the 24 carat spies were caught long before Joe McCarthy joined the hunt. And it was said of Joe McCarthy that he could have been dropped into the middle of Red Square on May Day and not known how to pick out a communist. And I think that's pretty close to the fact. So we have a question. I wanna remind um, our audience that you can ask questions and, um, and when I see them, I, I will be happy to ask Larry. Uh, one question's come in, how did Joe McCarthy get away without showing proof of individuals' communist involvement? Because when you held up the, the paper, as he had held them up, the, the report, uh, we don't know if there are any names on there at all, and we, we never knew even where he pulled that number out. Um, so Joe McCarthy, in his ultimate brilliance and cynicism, chose Wheeling, West Virginia, to give that speech because he knew there would be only two reporters there, the local reporter for the Wheeling Intelligencer and the local AP reporter. He knew that they wouldn't know who to call in the State Department, he knew if he gave the speech at dinner time, they wouldn't have time to call anybody, even if he, they, the reporters knew who to call. And he knew that they wouldn't be able to demand of him the way more powerful and seasoned reporters would to see that evidence of what was in his hand. So everywhere he went for the next week, it was to an outlying burg somewhere where likewise there would be inexperienced reporters and it was generally over the weekend. He, Every time he was asked to produce that evidence, he said, I left my speech in my list back in the plane, or it's in my briefcase and I don't have my briefcase. I think his, his numbers kept changing over that next week. Sometimes it was 205, sometimes it was 207, and my favorite number was 57. 
And my theory on why he kept using the number 57 was that he loved hamburgers and he loved to put Heinz 57 sauce on his hamburgers. And I think he decided that was as good a number as any since his numbers had no basis in fact. When the Senate finally investigated his numbers, they ended up coming back with a very simple conclusion. Joe McCarthy, you are a fraud and you are a hoax. And the lead senator who spelled out that conclusion the next November lost his election race, a guy named Millard Tidings from Maryland, because Joe McCarthy took his bulldozer to Millard Tidings. And that sent a clarion message to other senators, beware of taking on Joe McCarthy, he can destroy you. So another question, what role did television play in Joe McCarthy's rise and fall? Um, and, and, and what role, I'm, I'm adding to that, what role did the media play? Because some of the hearings that McCarthy held, uh, he held most of them he held in private, very few in public, and he, he used his own discretion um, fairly shrewdly about who he would have in private and who he'd have in public. So the media and we'll get to television in a second, the media generally played a huge role in his rise. What every newspaper reporter, and sorry, Lisa, newspaper reporters were the reporters of the day back in the 1950s, and every newspaper reporter wanted then like they want now one thing more than anything, which is to be on page one. And Joe McCarthy put him on page one. No matter the fact that he would release his findings late enough that they would make it on page one and the response the next day would make it on page 24. He knew how to play the press. He knew how to charm the press. And when the news got bad in later days, he knew how to blame the press. Television played some role in his rise, but it played a much bigger role in his demise. In the late years of McCarthy's reign, and I'm talking about the end of 1953 and 1954, a famous Radio reporter who became a famous TV reporter named Edward R. Murrow did reports on Joe McCarthy that were incredibly scathing and that helped bring him down. The sad thing is that Murrow got involved much too late. And while he is lionized in a famous movie called Good Night and Good Luck as the McCarthy Slayer, he was in fact late to the game. Television also played an extraordinary role in the Army McCarthy hearings in letting America, night after night, see that this guy was not their brave champion, he was the town bully. And that, more than anything, I think, exposed him and brought him down. So what happened? Give us an idea of some of the people who he would bring um, before the committee uh, in public versus private and his behavior in public versus private. Yes. So one of the other trove of documents that was there before I started writing my book, but that nobody had taken a deep dive, deep dive into, were his private hearings. And by private, I mean he tossed out the press, he banned the public, and once he got there behind closed doors, we didn't know what he was going to do. And we didn't know for another 50 years because those, those transcripts were kept secret. And when they were finally released, they show a number of things about Joe McCarthy. They showed when he went behind closed doors that any semblance of recognizing the accused as having any rights were tossed out the window. He presumed the people who came before him were guilty. He treated them that way. We also see that in violation of every Senate norm, and we're here at the Kennedy Institute where we're talking about a lion of the Senate and all the norms that Ted Kennedy observed. Well, Joe McCarthy observed none of those. He tossed out the rules. He, had, he held one-man hearings. And when he wasn't the one who was raking witnesses over his coals, he had his sophomoric staffers, people like Roy Cohn, take over the grilling. One more thing I want to say about those closed-door hearings. And until I got access to McCarthy's medical records, uh, thousands of pages from Bethesda Naval Hospital, I couldn't have said this definitively. But I thought there was a strange process that was going on, that in the mornings, Joe McCarthy looked sober and rational behind those closed doors. And in the afternoon, he looked even more sinister and out of control. And I speculated in my own mind and the historian, the chief historian of the Senate speculated along with me that it was because Joe McCarthy had had his trademark lunch of a burger, a raw onion, and plenty of whiskey. Uh, 
and that in the afternoon, the reason he lost his temper so quick was that he was drunk. Well, I think that we can now say from his medical records, which traced the increasing amount of alcohol that he was consuming, that in the afternoon, he clearly had had too much to drink and that did change his behavior. It doesn't excuse what he did, but it explains a lot of what he was doing. So how do you explain the fact that he was allowed to carry on this way, um, assuming the people were, were guilty and uh, stripping them of what would be their normal rights? And why did the Senate let him do that? So before I say that, I want to just say these questions are a sign of why we were all Lisa Mullins groupies. Um, but the answer on why he did that was because he had enablers. I have a whole chapter called the enablers. And by enabler, I mean the people who let him get away with these outrageous things that he did. First set of enablers, the Texas oil men who were his biggest benefactors. They used to call him the third senator from Texas because he did such a good job representing their interests. Second set of enablers, his fellow senators who watched what happened to Millard Tidings when McCarthy went in and helped bring this titan of the Senate down, cost him his reelection. And the rest of the senators looked around. The Democrats said, we don't want to lose any more of our members. The Republicans, when they finally got the majority, said, we don't want to lose our narrow majority by taking on one of our own. The man who I called the enabler in chief was Dwight Eisenhower. From the day Eisenhower took office in January of 1953, his very smart brother Milton whispered in Dwight's ear saying, give up a tiny bit of your popularity and bring down that bully McCarthy. Dwight agreed that McCarthy was a bully, but he said the best way to bring him down is to let him do himself in. The problem was that took a year and a half. And the problem is during that year and a half, nearly a dozen people, including two US senators that I could point to, committed suicide because of Joe McCarthy. Hundreds of careers were ruined and millions of people were afraid to discuss their politics, especially if that politics was all to left of center because of Joe McCarthy. One last enabler in chief I wanna mention very briefly, and that was us. It was ultimately the people of Wisconsin and the American people who let McCarthy, like with every demagogue, do their demagoguery. And I think if we don't accept the responsibility for this, we will never learn from that lesson. Uh, so in terms of um, accepting responsibility um, and trying to get us off the hook as I am, were people, the average um, uh, American, were they aware of the severity of what was happening? Um, they were aware of the severity and they were by in 1954, at the beginning of 1954, when the famous army McCarthy hearings happened, Joe McCarthy had the support, the Gallup poll told us, of exactly 50% of Americans. One in every two Americans thought he was doing a great job. And to put that in context, the only public figure with a higher level of support was Dwight Eisenhower. And Americans understood McCarthy and what he was doing better than they did any other public figure, certainly any other senator. They bought into it. And until the middle of 1954, they went along with this bullying behavior in a way that all of us today find shocking. And yet we see parallels. People continue to get away with this kind of thing. Um, and just by way of background, it's interesting because McCarthy started off as a Democrat and became an ardent Republican. So Joe McCarthy started out not just as a Democrat, but as an FDR loving New Deal Democrat. He starts off at the left wing of the Democratic Party and decides after he loses his first election running as a Democrat for a local district attorney position, decides that a Democrat's never going to win in rural Wisconsin. So sometime probably in the middle of the night when nobody was looking, he quietly changes his party registration to Republican to run for his next office. But he wasn't just a Republican. He was what they called in Wisconsin a stalwart Republican, meaning the most right-wing part of the Wisconsin Republican Party. 
So he was enough of an opportunist without blinking. He goes from liberal Democrat to whatever it takes to get elected, which happened to be a conservative Republican. And ironically, um, during that same period, somebody who became his young staffer named Robert Kennedy was on exactly the opposite political transition process. Robert Kennedy started out his life as a Joe McCarthy cold warrior and ends up becoming an iconic liberal. And for one moment in that transition, both of them were making, they crossed paths, became friends for life. And Ethel Kennedy, 70 years later, would say that he was just plain good fun. So just, I wanna pick up on, on that before we get back to the hearings themselves. What was an example of the good fun? Why, what, what was she remembering? What she was remembering was the fact that Joe McCarthy would come during the summer to the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport. He would play baseball with the Kennedy team, the Kennedys, as everybody probably knows, in the Bobby and Ted Kennedy generation had the perfect number of siblings to form a nine person baseball team. But they let Joe McCarthy play shortstop until he made four errors and they benched him. He came there, he had a great time drinking with Papa Joe, hanging out with the kids, dating Eunice and Patricia Kennedy, um, trying to date Gene who thought he was outrageously old and said, go away. Um, he would go out on the boat with them until they discovered when they threw him overboard that he didn't know how to swim and he didn't do much of that anymore. But he had, he had a great time with whoever he was, wherever he was, and his time at Hyannisport and in Palm Beach at the Kennedy compound there was just more one sign of how this guy was at one level lovable, which is why Wisconsin uh, loved him overwhelmingly twice in voting him in as their US Senator and why he goes down in history as maybe being the most malevolent character that America's ever produced. Just, just quickly uh, insert in here the alliance, to what extent there was an alliance between the um, Kennedys, Irish Catholics, and Joe McCarthy, Irish Catholic, not completely Irish, but uh, as you say, he, he had a very different background. It wasn't the lace curtain Irish of the Kennedys of High Asport or Palm Beach. He did have a very different background, and yet Papa Joe Kennedy thought that Joe McCarthy was exactly his kind of guy. Um, they were both the people who said what they thought, no matter what people thought of it. They were both proud Irish Catholic, and they both had the same mantra, which was, it's either for us the White House or the outhouse. Only they didn't use the word outhouse. They used something more colorful that I won't say today, but it was basically the idea that they were going to aim for the top. And if they tumbled like both of them ended up doing, so be it. And their political alliance was cemented. It was forged in part in the 1940s um, when, I'm sorry, in, in 1950s when Joe McCarthy hired as his young aide Bobby Kennedy, a recent graduate from smack in the middle of his law school class who was desperate for a job. Papa Joe had given enough money to Joe McCarthy that when he picked up the phone and said, would you hire my son, Bobby? Joe McCarthy said yes. But the real cementing of the alliance was an even more critical event in the history of the Kennedy family. And that was when Jack Kennedy, a young and inexperienced congressman, decided he was gonna challenge in 1952 the very powerful Senator Henry Cab Cabot Lodge for the Senate seat in Massachusetts. And Joe Kennedy was smart enough to understand that if Joe McCarthy came in to Massachusetts to campaign for Lodge the way Lodge wanted, that could pull away enough Catholic votes from Jack Kennedy to give the victory to Lodge. So Papa Joe Kennedy said just one thing to Joe McCarthy, you can do me a huge favor, stay the heck out of Massachusetts. Joe McCarthy obliged. Jack Kennedy, in the year of an Eisenhower landslide, when Eisenhower won in Massachusetts by nine points, Jack Kennedy won by a very narrow three percentage points. It is true that had Joe McCarthy come into Massachusetts, Jack Kennedy could very well never have been a senator. And again, we wouldn't have a Kennedy Institute probably, and we wouldn't have a JFK library, and we wouldn't have this extraordinary story of the dynastic Kennedys. So 
It is one of the ironies in political history in America that the ultimate cold warrior helped launch the ultimate iconic American liberal family. And, and Bobby Kennedy, um, how do you explain um, the kinship there? So I explain the kinship because Joe McCarthy gave Bobby Kennedy a, a job in a moment when he needed one. I explain it because Bobby Kennedy back then was a cold warrior and he thought Joe McCarthy was the one guy with the courage to stand up and say, let's root out those communists. And I explain it because Bobby was unlike Jack, loyal to the last second. When Jack Kennedy said, I'm not gonna go to Joe McCarthy's funeral, Jack Kennedy in 1957 was plotting probably the same way he was doing from the instant he came out of the womb, his trajectory to the White House, he realized that going with all these Republicans to honor Joe McCarthy was a place he didn't want to be. And he didn't want his little brother there either. So he told Bobby to stay away. Bobby did what little brothers generally do when big brothers give them advice. He listened, he ignored it. He went to Appleton, Wisconsin to Joe McCarthy's funeral. At the funeral service, he stayed up in the choir loft where nobody could see him. At the graveside service, all the celebrities are over here and Bobby Kennedy is over here where nobody could see him. After the service, when all the reporters were writing down the names of every famous person from Washington who had showed up there, Bobby Kennedy went up to them and begged them. He said, you can get me, keep me out of the, the doghouse with my big brother, Jack, if you keep my name out of your story. 50 years later, I was lucky enough to find one of the reporters who wrote those stories and kept Bobby's name out of it. And he told everything that had happened at that service with Bobby Kennedy. So Bobby Kennedy had it both ways. He stayed loyal to his brother, Jack, by not showing up in the press. And he stayed loyal to his pal, Joe McCarthy, by being there at his funeral. Larry, could you tell us about some of the people you interviewed um, who were brought before um, the investigative committees and um, the kind of questions they were asked, the kind of responses they gave? Maybe you can show us a little bit of the spectrum and what, what happened to them as a result. So I want to tell you about one guy, and I want to tell you about this guy partly because it's a Boston connection and partly because his story is emblematic about what happened to McCarthy's victims. I wanted to see what it meant to be a target of Joe McCarthy. Was it a momentary inconvenience or did it have some longer lasting effect? And this was a guy named Ray Kaplan, a mid-level engineer for the Voice of America. And Ray Kaplan was about to be called before Joe McCarthy's committee to explain what McCarthy said was the sabotage of radio transmitters. McCarthy was alleging that the Voice of America had put its radio transmitters at a place that it knew would have a less strong signal to sabotage the Voice of America getting its message behind the Iron Curtain. Ray Kaplan was the liaison with the engineers at MIT who decided where to site those radio towers. Ray Kaplan was in a panic. He was about to be called before Joe McCarthy. So he takes a last minute trip to Cambridge to MIT looking for all the engineers who can back him up, saying it wasn't you who sabotaged this operation. And the op operation really was never sabotaged. He can't find those engineers. He leaves MIT, is walking out onto the very busy Mass Avenue. A truck driver slows down his truck, seeing Kaplan about to get into the crosswalk. As he's slowing down, Kaplan darts in front of his truck, ends up being run over and ends up dying. He leaves behind a suicide note saying to his wife and his young son, I was so afraid that I was gonna embarrass myself and embarrass you by being called before this McCarthy committee that I felt like there was no other way out. You asked about people I interviewed. 70 years after that fact, I interview Ray Kaplan's boss, a guy named George Jacobs. And the one thing I wanna to read to you from that interview was, Jacobs says, it was cause and effect all the way. If there had been no Joe McCarthy, we would still have Ray Kaplan. And I think we could say that about so many of his victims 
whose lives he ruined. What, what eventually turned the tables on Joe McCarthy? So the world thinks that what eventually turned the tables was the Army McCarthy hearings when he took on an enemy too big to bully. And anybody who was old enough to have been there and watched those hearings, or anybody who has seen all the movies where those hearings were played up, would think that it was one moment in those hearings when a leprechaun-like brilliant lawyer from Boston named Joe Welch said what may be the most famous words ever uttered by a lawyer anywhere. He said when McCarthy attacked his young associate and accused this guy named Fisher of being a red or a pinko, Welch said, Senator, have you no sense of decency? At long last, have you no decency? Well, that was a brilliant line. It was in fact in Welch's back pocket to be used at whatever moment, and he knew there would be many of them, where McCarthy went off the rails. But I think what really turned around the public's attitude about McCarthy, McCarthy started out those hearings with a 50% popularity rating. He ended them just a few months later with a 34% popularity rating. And I think what turned it around was what we talked about earlier, the public getting to watch him night after night, looking like a bully and the public decided this was not their champion. And if McCarthy had had a better spinmeister, or if he had not been on television for those hearings, he might have lasted forever. But instead, people saw him for what they were and decided him that that's not what they wanted. And in, in the time, I mean, you, we know that people took their lives um, because of uh, what they feared or what happened um, before, uh, Joe McCarthy, but also tell us about some of the other um, basically wrecked lives that happened as a result. I mean, there are people who had to leave the country, um, people who left their families, um, lives were completely disassembled uh, even, even after. So they were after, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that the legacy of McCarthy and McCarthyism were felt not just by the people who came before him then, but it was felt by the people who ended up being killed in a place like Vietnam, where I'm convinced we went to war for two reasons that are linked to Joe McCarthy. One is all of what they call the China hands, the real experts on China and on Southeast Asia at the State Department, McCarthy had rooted out of the State Department. He said they were too red tinged. And these were the people who could have helped us understand what was really going on in Vietnam when we got into Vietnam. But it was also the Democrats like Jack Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson knew that they would be accused of losing Vietnam the same way Democrats were accused of losing China and that they got us into a war that we should never have been in, in part because this sense that being accused of being a red or a socialist or sympathetic to that was something that electorally was poison. And even today, you raise the charge of being a socialist and it sticks in a way that you would think 70 years later, we would know better. And that goes back to Joe McCarthy and his Red Scare. Can you explain also, we talk about the Red Scare, can you explain also what Joe McCarthy, why he had it in for the US military? And also he was uh, very suspicious of anyone who seemed to have a, what I think was, was called something like a homosexual heir. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even say it that way. So there was, in addition to the Red Scare, there was the Lavender Scare. McCarthy didn't originate that but he was out there looking for anybody that he could accuse of being gay. And what he said was, and it was an ultimate, one of the many ultimate tragedies and ironies of the McCarthy era. He said that if you are gay, you are susceptible to blackmail by the Russians if they find out that you are, and this makes you susceptible to being recruited as a spy. Well, if anybody had secrets that he didn't want revealed, it was Joe McCarthy himself. He was a gambler. He was an alcoholic. He had all kinds of things in his closet and he was perhaps more vulnerable than anybody. So I think that was a fig leaf. McCarthy with his gay top aide Roy Cohn 
was the ultimate cynic in going after gays because they were vulnerable. He was a cynic in going after reds that weren't red. He was a cynic in going after Jews because I think McCarthy, and we probably don't have time to get into all of that, but there's lots of evidence that it was not just accidental that so many of his targets in the army and elsewhere were Jewish. And the Anti-Defamation League thought that this was something that just smelled bad. And I think that McCarthy's ultimate enemy was Eastern elites and anybody that he could get away with as he painted himself as a populist. And they were the other, they were the scapegoat. Um, we, we have less than 10 minutes to go. Um, and I'll try to get to a few more questions here. Um, can you tell me, uh, Larry, in terms of the, the material that you were able to see for the first time, what was there that left your jaw dropped? Uh, that, that made you drop, uh, your, your jaw drop. I mean, what was it like to go through some of this material and when did you have kind of aha moments? So I had aha moments every 25 minutes when I was going through the material because it had everything from, we talked about the real time uh, military diaries. It had his love letters to his wife. It had one document after another stamped top secret from the FBI and CIA making clear the kinds of high level leaks that he was getting. But I want to read you in the um, uh, second that I have to uh, finish answering this question. I want to read you two quotes that left me jaw dropping in terms of where we are in our era today. And they are a quote. Um, one quote is from Donald Trump and another quote is from back um, half a century before. And the quote from Donald Trump may have been the most famous thing that he said in the 2016 campaign when he boasted to his supporters, and I quote, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. End of his quote. 62 years before, the polling pioneer George Gallup said this about McCarthy's supporters, and I quote, even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, McCarthy supporters would probably still go along with him. And to me, one of the most jaw-dropping things was that echo and all the other echoes I saw between Joe McCarthy's era and today's era. The book is called, for a reason, Demagogue, and it's because Joe McCarthy became the archetype for all the bullies who came after him. And Roy Cohn, McCarthy's associate, um, was um, uh, an associate early on of Donald Trump. What's the through line there? So Roy Cohn was the flesh and blood through line from Joe McCarthy to Donald Trump. Roy Cohn was the brilliant, arrogant lawyer from New York that Joe McCarthy hired to be his chief of staff and chief counsel when he first got into the majority and took over his powerful subcommittee. Roy Cohn reinforced every bad instinct in Joe McCarthy's bones. Half a century later, when a young Donald Trump is getting involved in the cutthroat world of New York real estate, Fred Trump and Donald Trump hire a not so young lawyer named Roy Cohn to tutor young Donald. Roy Cohn passed on to Trump every lesson he learned at the knee of Joe McCarthy. They were things like in lieu of solutions, point fingers. When you're attacked, aim a wrecking ball at your opponent. And when you can't charm the press, blast the press. Roy Cohn was a good teacher. Donald Trump was a good student. Every time Donald Trump has gotten into trouble in the last three and a half years, he says, I wish I had a Roy Cohn at my side. And I think if it were acceptable politically to say this, what he would really say is, I wish I had a Joe McCarthy at my side. So, so that can only happen with quote unquote enablers. Um, so why does the American public, why, why was Joe McCarthy, and not just the public, but also the, the government, why was uh, the government so supportive of Joe McCarthy until it wasn't? And, um, and what, is, what is it about Donald Trump that you see similar to Joe McCarthy that Americans applaud? So I think, very much like Joe McCarthy was responding to a very real fear of the Soviet Union, 
Donald Trump is responding to a very real fear of economic dislocation, that some Americans were left behind. If we can remember back to the time there was economic prosperity, in that prosperity, some Americans were left behind. Trump responded to it, but he responded to it like McCarthy with scapegoats. McCarthy blamed non-existing communists behind every pillar in the State Department. Trump explains refugees streaming across the border or other easy people to scapegoat, and it makes a compelling narrative, and the public accepts it until they stop accepting it, and we'll see when that is now. And with Joe McCarthy, what was, what was his end? Um, so his end was that he watched his popularity plummet uh, during those Army McCarthy hearings. Senators who had no courage in standing up to him when they saw him at 50% popularity, when he dropped to 34%, they suddenly developed courage. In, at the end of 1954, the Senate took an incredibly rare step of censuring him. And when he was condemned by his colleagues, while he lived for another two and a half years, his political life ended that day, I think, in 1954, when he was censured. And we can see from his medical records that his consumption of alcohol took off from that moment on. And he was a very sad and tragic wrecked man. And his official coroner's report and all the press reports of what he died of said he died of acute hepatitis. We can see from his medical records that he died of the effects of alcoholism and that for the last time before he died, he was suffering from the DTs in a way that makes you shiver when you read these reports. What other parallels do you draw to today? So I think the parallel is to today and to every era in America that while I thought when I started my McCarthy book that we had outgrown those simplistic answers and the demagogue's solutions, the parallel is no matter what the era is, no matter what the media is, we as a people are vulnerable the same way people in Russia are and in Germany and in Italy and anywhere in the world are vulnerable to easy answers. And my only hope, and this is a hope that um, I think is appropriate to discuss as we're ending um, with a place like the EMK Institute, the hope is that places like that, that teach us to respond to the best of our politics can teach us to avoid the worst of our history. And I'd like to end on a positive note, which is my, my book is a biography of a very bleak character named Joe McCarthy, but it is ultimately a good news story. And the good news is that every demagogue throughout our history, given sufficient rope, hung themselves. Every time we had a demagogue in power in America, given sufficient time, the American people rediscovered our better nature and saw through them. Thank you very much. Uh, and right on time. And this, if anybody hasn't seen it, is the book, uh, Demagogue by Larry Ty, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. Uh, so nice to talk to you. Thank, thank you, everybody uh, watching for your questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to them all, but I think to most. Um, thank you again. Caroline, back to you. Thank you so much, Larry and Lisa, for this truly enlightening and deeply resonant conversation. As many of us, I think, try to make sense of the fear and rhetoric coming from halls of power, both perhaps back in the 1950s as well as today, hopefully we can draw some inspiration from those few brave voices that eventually spoke up against Senator McCarthy's agenda to undermine democracy. We can realize that our own voices can be powerful too. With that, a few reminders, of course, of how you can use your own voice. Please make sure that you're registered to vote. If you're joining us from Massachusetts today, you do have the opportunity to request a mail-in ballot for the September state primary and general election. If uh, you misplaced that request card that probably came in your mailbox a week or two ago, you can find the form on the Secretary of State's website. Also, please, if you have not done so already, take five minutes to fill out your census at 2020census.gov. Every person counts. On behalf of the Institute, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.